the first thing I want to say is that I think the word inspire is really overused, um, certainly in English. It's become a meaningless word. And when I was preparing for this talk today, I started to Google the word inspire, and some of the things that I found online made me burst out laughing. Um, there's a cosmetics company called Inspire. There are garages in Scotland that talk about Inspire. Footballers talk about Inspire all the time. What is, to, to me, and these are just my views incidentally, I'm not passing on anybody else's. What, to, what does this word Inspire mean in the arts? It's about being real. It's about being live. Now I know there's a lot of controversy about this because there's a lot of art now in the performing arts that is streamed. Um, into cinema, certainly in the UK. But I want to talk a little bit today about how this is a live experience. It's about being authentic, about speaking in a true voice. And perhaps because I work in the arts and my job is about encouraging those relationships, it's about believing that the arts and culture change our outlook, change our politics sometimes, and can change our views. And I would say this because it's my job, but it's because I believe that the arts and culture matter just as much as health or health and safety or transport or education. And I'm quite often asked when I go out and give interviews for the company I work for, the National Theatre Scotland, yes, but surely we should be spending money to build more hospitals or to build more schools. Surely this is about prioritising the health service. And I say, possibly, but we are part of the health service. Only this is the bit that we help to nurture. It's not about hospitals or theatres, it's about hospitals and theatres. It's not an either or. Okay, weirdly, I want to talk about why people are not inspired to attend the arts for a second. Why do people not go? Um, because they think it's not for them. It's just a thing that they don't do. And again, we don't have time to talk about this terribly much today. I would love to keep the conversation going though, because we don't have time. This is the new currency. Um, lots of people will tell you people don't attend the arts because they can't afford it. There's very little evidence to support that. Actually, if people want to go, they will pay for it. It's not a bargain at one lira if you don't want to see it. So the currency now is time. Can you find a way into people's incredibly busy lives to make this significant for them? Why else do people not go? Because they don't conform to the typical demographic. And that typical demographic, at least in the UK or certainly in Europe, is you're white, you're middle class, and you've got money. It's also that you're tertiary educated. In the UK, the biggest indicator of why you will end up being an arts supporter or an arts goer when you're older, the biggest indicator is that you are tertiary educated. So people like you in this room who are now becoming tertiary ed educated, I would venture to suppose are multiple percentage points more likely to become arts attenders. Why else do people not go? Because they're not in the right town, village, city, location. Because that's happening in Ankara and you're living somewhere else or in where I live because the cathedral of the arts is in Edinburgh and you live on one of our 800 islands that we have in Scotland that are inhabited, and the art hasn't come to you. Why else do people not go? Because you weren't taken as children. This is another seriously enormous indicator. All the research indicates that if you are taken as a child, you are multiple percentage points more likely to attend the arts as an adult. And it doesn't necessarily mean you were taken at school, that it was a school trip. Usually, it's because some significant adult in your childhood has been influential. So it might be your parents, it might be a godparent, it might be an aunt, it might be a friend. But if you're taken as a child, you are much more likely for that to be something that is part of your socialization. Why else are people not motivated to attend? Because they're poor, or they're disadvantaged, or they're immigrants, or they're disabled, and we don't make it easy enough for these minority groups to attend. We don't bring down the barriers in my industry properly to encourage these minority groups to attend. Why else do they not go? Because they're too busy going to the football. <laughs> well, are they? 
So in the UK, 2012, in May, to May 2013, there were 31 million attendances in the UK at Premier League football matches. In the same period, there were 33 million attendances to theatre. More people attend theatre in the UK than attend football in the UK. Not that you would know it from our media. My previous colleague who was talking about body image, who was talking about the media. Yeah, I think this is a similar issue. Not you would know it from our media where 18 pages of every newspaper and 20 minutes of every news programme are devoted to football. I don't object to that. However, I think the myth that people don't attend the arts in preference to going to football is something that needs to be challenged. Okay, why do people go? So that's been a little bit negative about why people don't go. Picasso said, every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist once he grows up. So why do people attend? Because they were taken as children. Please let's take that responsibility. Um, for study, and these are only a tiny number of examples of why people go for studying. Ironically, one of the things that comes out in research again and again and again, why have you come to this gallery today? Because I'm in holiday in this city. Because I'm in Paris on holiday, and because when you're in Paris on holiday, you go to the Louvre, or when you're in Rome, you go to a gallery. Why else do people go? Um, now this is an interesting one. People will tell you repeatedly in research, but why are you at this opera today? Well, because my father used to listen to it at home. I heard it when I was a child. Well, why have you come to this musical? Well, it's about Frank Sinatra, and my mother used to listen to Frank Sinatra. I heard it as a child. I think you might be getting, beginning to get my picture here about bringing this into your family customs and your social customs when people are young. Um, why else do people go? Because it's a sociable thing to do, and this is overlooked a lot. And in my industry, um, one of your colleagues was asking me earlier on about being a curator, which I'm not. Um, but there's something, uh, I don't know if you've come across this thing called International Art English. If you haven't, you need to Google it. It's absolutely hilarious. There was an article written about it a few years ago, about the, um, in this case again, English that has developed, um, particularly to do with contemporary arts, uh, visual arts, um, how to describe the work, which is a complete obfuscation, because what it does is to distance you from the art. When you look at the statistics about why people attend the visual arts or why they go to galleries, if you look at the bottom figure there, 44%, these figures are for England, 44% of people tell you that they're there because it's something to do. They're not there for soul food, they're not there to have their politics challenged, they're there because perhaps they have a relative in town and they take that relative to the gallery because it's a sociable thing to do. And again, it's something that I challenge my own industry to think about how we describe these experiences and can we move away from the very, very elitist way of sometimes describing the arts and think about the fact that we want to make it accessible to people who are there simply to do. Why else do people go? To feel something. There was an amazing study done a few years ago by an American consultancy called Rule Brown into the impact of um, the performing arts on audiences. And one of the big findings that they came out with was this, uh, this thing called flow. We use this word flow. That people will go in particular to the performing arts to feel something. They want to be moved, they want to be taken into a different world, and they will talk about getting, getting lost. I wonder if anyone in the room today has ever had that experience of getting lost, sitting in an auditorium, and that feeling that flow has begun to happen. Okay, I want to talk for a minute or two about my organisation. I work for the National Theatre of Scotland. We're a very young company, we're only 10 years old. This is our 10th birthday this year. We were brought about in Scotland as a result of devolved government when the Westminster government in London finally let go of some of the uh, April strings and allowed us to have devolution um, in 1999. We are a theatre without walls. 
until very recently we were the only national theatre in the world not to have a theatre. We were set up not to have the cathedral-like building that we expected people to come to. We go to them. So wherever we can find an audience, wherever artists want to work, that might be up in the north of Scotland, in the Orkneys, in the Shetlands, in the borders on some of our islands. We take our work there and we produce our work all over Scotland, indeed all over the world. And we have engaged with millions of people in hundreds of communities. Over the last 10 years, 81% of the Scottish population has been within 20 miles of one of our events. And that's something that we hold really important to our hearts. It's incredibly important that we um, reinforce this right of equality of geographical access for our audiences all over the country. I've got a very short video to show you. It's only two or three minutes long. I'll show you a little bit about our work. Which doesn't seem to have any sound. Cut out technical stuff. Able-bodied. 
But what you're trying to communicate is that you're an organization that wishes to be accessible to people who are not white, not rich, have disabilities, and so on and so on. You're going to fail. We spend a lot of time thinking about what the inside of an organization looks like, making sure that we can be uh, as reflective of the diversity of New Scotland as possible in all her communities and with all her disabilities. Um, I'm going to move on and talk very briefly, just for the last minute or two, about this notion of inspiration. And can you all think, just for 10 seconds, about what is the most inspirational live experience that you have ever had? And then what I want you to think about is how you talk about that. And again, I just want to go back to that thing about how we communicate the arts and the wonderful joy of sharing the arts out there in the world. Because again, frequently, if you think about the vocabulary that we use, I don't just mean in English, we tend in my industry not to talk about the arts the way you've probably just thought about this in your head. I think if you think about a meal, it's an interesting one. If you try to describe the taste, a wonderful meal that you've had and what that food tastes like and the words that would use that you would use is this the sort of way that we can begin to think about how we communicate in the arts. Here's the most inspirational live experience I've ever had and I'm sorry it is one of my own organization's experience. Um, we did a program a few years ago called Transform where we based ourselves in communities of deprivation around Scotland and there are many communities of deprivation uh, communities, uh, post-industrial communities, blighted by poverty, frankly. Um, this photograph was taken in a place called Kilmarnock, it's in the central belt of Scotland, a very deprived community where we based ourselves in a high school for a number of months. We embedded a team of artists there and we worked with the young people in the schools. That was magic. We worked with the young people in the schools. Oh, let's go back to the video. Um, in order to develop their self-esteem. That is a group of hearing impaired young people, hearing impaired and profoundly deaf. And what our artists decided to set up, because there was a great amount of music in this piece that we developed with them, a theatre piece, was they set up a choir, a chorus, for the hearing impaired and profoundly deaf young people. <coughs> And you would think that that would be a contradiction in terms. How could you think about having a choir for children who are hearing impaired and profoundly deaf? But we called it a signing choir. So they signed the music. What they're doing there, as you can see, unfortunately, I can't do sign language, but that is them performing the music in British Sign Language. One of the boys who's not photographed, um, a 13-year-old boy who was in that school as part of this group of deaf and um, hearing impaired young people, um, we were told <coughs> afterwards by his parents, had never once in 13 years ever uttered a single sound. Not once in 13 years. And at that performance, when the signing choir got up to perform their piece, he sang. I, even when I tell you that, I find myself beginning to want to cry at what an important live experience that was and how that boy's discovery of his voice <coughs> inspired the people in that room to understand that the arts can change your life. I'm going to finish by sharing with you something that is, uh, describes this in a way that, that I could never do. It's much, much better than I could ever do. I know that Ted X is flashing at me, but I'm hearing this. Um, Baz Luhrmann is an Australian film director. I bet you know him. Um, he directed Strictly Ballroom and Moulin Rouge at Romeo and Juliet. Do you know where I mean? Have you ever seen any of those films? Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. Oh, He's an extraordinary yeah, person. He was asked back to his old school in Australia to make a speech at Fry's Giving. And this is an excerpt of what he said, and I salute him. And these are his words. Enjoy the power and beauty of your youth. Oh, never mind. You will not understand the power and beauty of your youth until they have faded. But trust me, in 20 years, you'll look back at photographs of yourself and you'll recall in a way that you can't grasp now how much possibility lay before you and how fabulous you really looked. 
you are not as fat as you imagine. <laughs> Do one thing every day that scares you. Sing. Don't be reckless with other people's hearts and don't push up with people who are reckless with yours. Remember the compliments that you receive and forget the insults. Be kind to your knees. You'll miss them when they're gone. Get to know your parents. You never know when they'll be gone. <coughs> Do not read beauty magazines. They will only make you feel ugly. <laughs> <laughs> Understand that friends come and go, but for the precious few, you should hold on. Don't mess too much with your hair, or by the time you're 40, it will look 85. <laughs> Maybe you'll marry, maybe you won't. Maybe you'll have children, maybe you won't. Maybe you'll divorce at 40. Maybe you'll dance the funky chicken on your 75th wedding anniversary. But, do dance every day. Even if you have nowhere to do it, but in your own sitting room. I think that's an incredible piece of inspiration from Baz Luhrmann. What I want to call on you to think about today is the fact that you, in this room, and I can see it, because I've seen you all now, you're the leaders of tomorrow's companies and local authorities and architectural practices and studios and families and homes. You are. Yeah. yeah. I want you to think about encouraging people's creativity, encouraging their authenticity and inspiring them. I'm calling on you to do that. We're relying on you to do that. You are the tastemakers of, of today, actually. I was going to say tomorrow, but not tomorrow. You are the tastemakers. You are the change makers. And we're relying on you to go forward into the next 50 years and make these things happen. And whatever you do, don't forget 